Yeah, so uh, this is uh, Mike Douglas, and this is the uh, New Technologies and Mathematics Seminar of the uh, CMSA at Harvard University. And today we're delighted to have uh, Ciro Zhang from Microsoft uh, Research who will tell us about uh, his work on how uh, Transformers Visa. This is a very exciting step uh, forward, and we're delighted that uh, Ciro come and give the uh, talk in person. Uh, as uh, I always do, I'll offer to uh, watch the uh, chat. So if you have a question and you'd like uh, you know, me to ask it, perhaps you're not, you're not sure about uh, the question, uh, put it in the chat and I'll bring it up at an appropriate time. And of course, uh, there'll be time for uh, questions at the end of the uh, talk. So with that, uh, Cyril, please. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Mike, for hosting. And uh, just thanks for coming. Thanks for braving the rain. Uh, and thanks for chiming in virtually, everyone. Um, it's uh, really a great pleasure to uh, share some of the work uh, we're doing in the weeds uh, with some math, some transformers, and uh, you know a string of things in between. Uh, so let's jump in. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time waxing poetic about you know current trends in AI, but I want all of us to sort of be on the same page uh, with respect to just noticing this interesting phenomenon going on. Uh, so if we just try to dissect what's actually going on behind the training of you know some large language model like GPT-3, uh, well we have a lot of internet text. You know some of this is Wikipedia, uh, some of this is you know uh, books, uh, and uh, in general we have lots of news articles and just you know uh, content crawled from the web from social media posts, and we're uh, training some large neural network uh, using incremental local search like SGD like algorithms uh, to perform next word prediction, right? And then it, okay, it does pretty well at next word prediction, but then emergently while well, we can evaluate these models on whatever we like, right? And so we can, uh, like, uh, without even having to go into kind of evaluation style papers, maybe I can convince you that something like reasoning is going on, which uh, we'll seek to formalize in this talk, right? So if we ask it to say complete, uh, like, uh, like, uh, uh, complete text that correspond where the correct completion corresponds to uh, executing some algorithm like sorting a list of numbers. Uh, this actually gets it right. Maybe uh, we can all agree that maybe this sequence did not appear in the training data. Um, you know, uh, and uh, just emergently, uh, you know, this is able to uh, say uh, perform stack operations um, and say extrapolate. Uh, you know. Um, like uh, recurrent sequences of integers. Um, so you know, these are, are sort of some of uh, primitive uh, like evaluations on like exponentially large input spaces that you can all verify yourselves. Um, and uh, just building up, uh, going up a level, uh, we can uh, see that language models can emergently understand, you know, parse and translate text. Uh, they can complete code, and this has become uh, very all the rage these days in uh, these like production applications. Uh, and uh, maybe the point is like in the current time, in the current era, this is accurate. This pipeline is accurate enough for like high impact in lots of applications, uh, from text-like domains uh, to less text-like domains. And we're starting to move on things like theorem proving. Uh, just came back from the Neurops Math and AI workshop uh, where uh, non-trivial progress is being made. Okay, uh, so this is the uh, phenomenon uh, that is certainly going on with current language models uh, that I wanna talk about. Um, okay, so uh, I guess some question here is, is that it? Uh, do we have uh, an artificial general intelligence circuit? Um, uh, probably not, right? Uh, and uh, certainly we can come up with cases uh, where this fails. If we ask this to uh, you know, uh, solve some uh, unsolved math problem, uh, certainly it gets stuck. It, it gets some like chains of uh, entailment right, uh, but you know, it conveniently fudges uh, you know, some step, maybe uh, like maybe we've done this before uh, on some math homework. Um, and uh, maybe even worse, uh, uh, these uh, models uh, whose internal mechanisms we do not understand may sometimes hallucinate uh, you know, uh, statements that do not correspond to true facts, right? Um, so, okay, we're not there yet. Uh, we have some of the primitives of combinatorial generalization and reasoning. Um, so I guess to further improve the to these tools and you know, move uh, up the ladder, uh, we should try to understand what's going on inside the networks. Um, I hope we're, we're sort of all on board with this, um, uh, with this uh, um, philosophy. Um, and uh, I guess uh, to just branch this question further into uh, some more useful questions where we can start maybe uh, eventually asking math questions, um, you know, we can uh, try to understand uh, like what functions these neural nets are representing, uh, how they generalize to unseen data, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, somewhat scarily, uh, like try to get some handle on the uh, nonlinear dynamical system of model training, uh, like the procedure that leads to these circuits being found. 
Um, okay. Uh, so now let's talk about what we'll talk about in this talk. Um, so I guess we'll be guided by this question of uh, you know trying to figure out the nuts and bolts, uh, the phenomena that are relevant towards understanding this emergent reasoning. Um, okay, towards that, we'll first provide an eclectic uh, you know a set of um, uh, background slides uh, on some mathematical concepts and also a very quick a rough uh, intuitive intro to the transformer architecture uh, the shape of circuit that has enabled these uh, large language models to uh, exhibit like such dramatic um, advances in these reasoning like domains um, then we'll get into the theoretical results in our work um, uh, where we uh, have some handle and maybe some of these results uh, kind of uh, genuinely surprised us on how these uh, networks are performing sequential reasoning tasks, uh, which we'll define using automata. Uh, and then we'll accompany this uh, with some experiments uh, where uh, theory cannot hope to reductionistically uh, explain uh, certainly any, everything that's going on in practice. But even in synthetic experiments, uh, we have a bunch of surprises. And this actually reveals uh, some failure modes, uh, perhaps, of transformers as they appear in the wild. Uh, and some broader discussion uh, where we'll take some questions and maybe we'll see uh, where the audience wants uh, the kind of speculation and uh, uh, discussion of like engineering considerations and details. Um, uh, like we'll see where everyone wants to go with that. Okay, uh, so this will be based on uh, this paper uh, that we posted pretty recently to archive. It's in submission. Um, uh, as to not, uh, as to just provide spoilers uh, off the bat, uh, we're going to analyze like these. Uh, this phenomenon of uh, transformers learning shallow shortcuts to what might appear to be long reasoning chains uh, will see that there is actually a problem with learning these shortcuts, uh, even though there are benefits of computational depth uh, of like hallucinating variables, uh, and uh, we'll get into potential mitigations and open uh, engineering challenges. Um, and I want to mention that this is a work with a fantastic group of collaborators. Uh, Bingbin Liu in particular uh, was um, uh, the intern uh, who uh, we had the privilege of hosting this past summer at MSR New York. Um, she is a grad student of like supervised by Andre Rusteski and Pradeep Ravi Kumar, and is the rare kind of student who you know will solve the hardest math problem you'll see in this talk uh, and run all the experiments. Uh, so you know, uh, props to her, um, and uh, also with uh, my wonderful colleagues. And uh, Serbia is headed to UPenn uh, in the next month. Great. Um, okay, background time. Um, so I want to first start with a definition, uh, just a mathematical definition, um, uh, like uh, of automata and their underlying structures, semi-automata, uh, and uh, that will form our grounding for reasoning, as we'll discuss in this talk. Um, then uh, we'll uh, talk about how like the automata are naturally associated with these algebraic structures, uh, semi-groups, uh, which just are like groups, but with fewer axioms. Uh, then we'll make a little detour of, of uh, one slide uh, into circuit complexity, uh, just to talk about the representation theory of you know, uh, simple compositions of simple composition uh, computational units. Um, and then we'll do a little uh, like um, uh, debrief on transformers, uh, just to uh, you know, provide some content out of left field of you know, classical math. Okay, uh, so let's start with automata. So I'm going to start with a bit of a clunky word, even though it's it's the simplest, most fundamental concept uh, in this talk, uh, and that's the concept of the semi-automaton. Right? And a semi-automaton is just a discrete time dynamical system, uh, like uh, defined by um, a set of states, a set of input symbols, uh, and a transition function. Right, uh, and like uh, it specifies this recurrent dynamical system, uh, which doesn't change over time, takes in an input sequence and maps that input sequence and an initial state to a sequence of states. Right. Um, so uh, here are some like uh, you know, primordial examples. Uh, one is this uh, two-state parity counter. Right. There's a coin that like has two sides that are distinguished from each other, and the inputs either do nothing to the coin or you know toggle the state of the coin. Um, okay, we can consider another like two state automaton here, uh, which is a memory unit. Uh, so instead, we can have a two state uh, machine that uh, effectively memorizes one bit, right? And then the three operations that allow it to do that, um, and uh, we can define the transition straightforwardly, uh, are uh, you know read bit zero, uh, sorry, write bit zero, write bit one, or read, right? There are these three operations, uh, and this uh, like uh, the sequence of states that this memory unit um, uh, kind of traverses. Uh, like behaves like a uh, memory, right? Between uh, between write operations, the read operations uh, kind of uh, are associated with um, the, uh, the most recent write. Okay, uh, so 
I guess so, uh, you know, towards building up some motivations later, um, like uh, certainly uh, this is uh, this is a special case of like what, you know, say in reinforcement learning or you know, say in like uh, if we're taking a view of modeling the dynamics of the world, uh, this is just a tabular uh, Markov process that is uh, deterministic, has no stochast stochastic transitions. Um, of course, uh, we can like uh, usefully and perhaps interestingly uh, compose uh, semi-automata together uh, to create kind of uh, you know, factorized dynamical systems. Uh, and just to give a sense of like how complexity can emerge from simple definitions here, uh, we can uh, certainly encompass the Rubik's cube in this definition, right? Viewing the Rubik's cube as where the state is the location of all 54 stickers on the cube and each face rotation um, applies some permutation to these stickers. Right. Um, Okay, and uh, certainly uh, I hope we can sort of be sympathetic to the combinatorial structure of this being totally non-obvious from the definition. Okay, uh, so now uh, why do I start with a semi-automaton? Well, uh, the shorter word, uh, maybe the concept uh, that we kind of encounter in some intro uh, theoretical computer science course is an automaton. And that's simply a semi-automaton equipped with an output function, uh, which could be the identity function or it could be something else, right? Say like a regular expression parser could be some machine uh, that in the end has some set of accepting states so that it outputs like a one. Uh, but uh, we're gonna study, study semi-automaton uh, uh, as, kind of uh, the underlying algebraic object, uh, you know, under underneath um, automata, which might produce some some partial observation. Okay, uh, and finally, we'll define this problem of simulation, right? So given some initial state and a sequence of inputs, the computational task is merely to output the, um, the sequence of states uh, under the transitions of that machine. Um, and I want to think of uh, simulation as executing a chain of uh, you know, big T reasoning steps. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, why am I calling this reasoning? Uh, I promised by slide eight I would uh, talk about that. Um, so uh, just to give a sense of how uh, general this definition is, right? This is really just any time invariant dynamical system. Uh, so even for a finite state space, you know, when uh, this, uh, this, this Q is a finite set, uh, this encompasses many uh, primitives of interest, uh, certainly like uh, regular expression, uh, regular expressions can be compiled down to um, like uh, automata, uh, which um, ingest a stream of uh, characters and a transition between states and uh, perhaps like some some of the states are accepting. Um, in general, uh, any algorithm that manages only a constant amount of memory uh, can be uh, formulated as a constant state space automaton. Um, and of course, we can further uh, restrict ourselves to interesting classes of, um, of even finite state automata. Um, and uh, allowing the state space to be unbounded, uh, you know, say, um, uh, like the tape of a Turing machine or you know, the, it's like some continuous state of the world, uh, certainly this is an extremely general definition. I hope uh, like, uh, like uh, there exist um, you know, many instantiations of automata in unbounded state spaces that uh, can express all computations. Right. Uh, and uh, and certainly there's another box of tools for restricting uh, like uh, unbounded automata of interest. Okay. Uh, so I guess for our purposes, uh, and you know we can discuss philosophy later, uh, but you know just to ground uh, the technical problems that we'll be tackling in this talk, uh, like uh, you know whenever I talk about reasoning, you can just substitute that word if you don't like it uh, with learning to execute the um, sequential steps of an automaton. Right. And the motivation here is that any algorithm can be embedded in some automaton of some size and maybe a restricted automata uh, you know, will, uh, will give us restricted algorithms. OK, uh, so now let's uh, jump into a simple motivating example. Uh, so now consider the problem of simulating this first uh, semi-automaton that I introduced, which is a parity counter, right? uh, this two-state machine. Um, so Obviously, just given the definition of the transitions, uh, we can just turn that into code into a straightforward simulation protocol, uh, which is you know, just given the initial state and all the inputs, uh, just sequentially infer uh, the states using the stepwise transition function. Right? Uh, uh, but I guess uh, maybe uh, like you know, we we call this a parity counter for some reason, uh, and uh, the, like the fact is, like the definition of this machine uh, induces uh, some non-trivial global properties of uh, of the computation that it performs. 
um, I guess if we notice that this simply uh, you know, performs a su summation mod two operation, uh, then we get a, a different solution for simulating this machine, right? Uh, so we can write this down as take the sum, uh, including of the initial state, uh, identifying you know, uh, even with zero and odd with one, and just simply computing mod two. Um, Right, so then the computational graph kind of looks like this. It's in one layer. Um, then, uh, so uh, if we say want to execute uh, this algorithm for many prefixes at once, uh, unlike the uh, straightforward like state emulation algorithm, um, this is parallelizable. Right? Uh, like uh, if we have uh, like big T many workers and we want to kind of uh, decode all the states, uh, we can as long as we can perform this like a uh, global uh, like pooling and then mod two operation, uh, we can do this in uh, like one computational step. Um, so uh, like this is really a depth one or you know, constant depth circuit uh, that uh, that simulates uh, the same machine. So there are these two different solutions with uh, like different qualities. So yes. Just to understand kind of the general version of what we mean by learning to reason is the general thing would be that uh, you are given a uh, say, a, a sequence of sta uh, of states um, that uh, correspond uh, to uh, how the semi-automaton uh, progresses under a certain uh, uh, fairly regular kind of repeating state or a set of uh, inputs, and you are uh, and the goal is now to be able to uh, continue to an arbitrary number of uh, um. number of steps. Uh, so not just a regular, uh, like not just a fairly regular uh, sequence of inputs, but any state of inputs, right? So it will only. If the state yeah. of input is random, then in some sense you would not be able to predict it, right? Like uh, so, you, you would not be able to extend the sequence if, say, the automaton just the state is the last in, uh, input read, and, and every time it's random. Uh, right. This is a deterministic system, right? So, uh, like. Uh, we're given some automaton in the simulation problem uh, for which we just like to compute the deterministic map from this uh, sequence of inputs uh, to the sequence of states uh, so that like this output is always correct. That's the definition uh, like for these purposes of uh, the simulation problem. I see, I see. So, 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 so the features are the inputs and the... Uh, the cues are the... Output uh, would be the sequence of states. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, we want a circuit that maps inputs uh, to state sequence. Great. Um, okay, and then there are these two different implementations of that of, of solutions to that task. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe this is all fairly trivial so far, uh, but uh, actually, this is. Uh, uh, yep. Sorry. So, if you make the the task predicting out for the automaton, the second task. Yes, if you can uh, simulate a semi-automaton, then you can simulate all automata, which just you know uh, just apply that um, final observation function uh, at the very last layer. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, now let's jump into uh, you know why some generalizations of this uh, may get non-trivial. Um, okay, so I guess uh, we've kind of noticed that you know the the first idea was that this machine counts parodies, right? Uh, so now in general, how do we generalize this statement? What are the algebraic structures associated with some given automaton? Um, okay, uh, so then uh, like some resolution to this, uh, some natural algebraic structure here um, is to associate each input symbol with an endomorphism, right? a, a map from states to states, uh, like a transformation. Um, so for the parity counter, uh, we'll like associate uh, with this, well, like what each um, input symbol does, right? The zero uh, symbol does nothing to the state and the uh, one symbol swaps the states. Um, okay, uh, then uh, certainly simulation for like some length T uh, is, uh, you know, we're just rewriting this as uh, like a composition of these uh, functions uh, like indexed by the uh, input symbols uh, applied to the initial state. Uh, and certainly, uh, maybe for intuition purposes, we can embed this in matrix multiplication, right? So uh, really, we just have a pile of matrices, uh, and we're multiplying a long sequence of them uh, in order to uh, get some uh, total composite transformation of a long sequence of uh, functions. 
Um, okay, so the thing to notice here is that these functions, uh, well, uh, this is a very general definition, but these functions do satisfy one axiom, uh, and that is the axiom that a semigroup needs to have, uh, which is associativity. Right? It doesn't matter uh, um, in what order we associate a function composition. Um, and I guess uh, some program of algebraic automata theory is to understand an automaton by its transformation semigroup. Um, so I'll give some examples uh, for the parity counter. Uh, maybe we, we already discussed, unsurprisingly, that this is the uh, cyclic group of order two. Uh, now for this other example, this other two-state machine, uh, this is actually already somewhat more interesting, right? So the uh, transformation semigroup here, well, there are three functions, um, and they compose according to this multiplication table. Um, and the thing to notice is that there are non-invertible functions here. Uh, well, you, uh, there had better be, otherwise this would uh, be a pretty poor uh, notion of memory. Um, and, uh, and there's an, uh, like the, the read operation course, uh, like, uh, does nothing to the state. And so it's an identity function, right? So, uh, a, a semi-group that has identity is, ca is called a monoid, but that's not important for our purposes. Um, okay. So more examples, uh, I guess you can, uh, generalize the parity counter easily and get, uh, you know, um, uh, counter mod n counters for any n, um, uh, certainly, uh, like the group uh, that is associated with the like closure of the uh, permutations um, uh, that uh, the Rubik's cube uh, face rotations uh, give us is the Rubik's cube group, um, and uh, this is some example of the combinatorial explosion of complexity possible just from a short uh, description. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, in general, when you have non-invertible operations, uh, in general, this is a semigroup, uh, and it's uh, not the flip-flop monoid. Uh, it's some other semigroup, uh, say attached to this uh, grid wall. Um, right, and so, like uh, as I mentioned, the uh, properties of the transformation semigroup are not all clear from the descriptions, right? And uh, indeed, lots of algorithmic questions here that uh, you could ask. Uh, for example, like, is there some sequence of inputs that uh, does the same thing as identity, uh, like are actually p-space hard search problems? Uh, but we, we're only going to talk about simulation, right? Uh, we're uh, only going to talk about execution of some known deterministic algorithm and learning that from data. Okay. Uh, so now let's, uh, okay, uh, in this whirlwind tour, let's uh, move on to circuit complexity. Um, so, uh, right, uh, and uh, this will, uh, it will all make sense why these uh, pieces are put together in a couple minutes. Um, so, uh, of course, a Boolean circuit um, uh, is just a computational graph that specifies some uh, computation and uh, the, uh, the nodes, uh, you know, can be uh, uh, selected from some basis of, you know, computational units. Um, and I guess the like grand program of this field of circuit complexity is to understand the uh, representation power of uh, circuits whose uh, like uh, complexity, or, uh, like circuits which are simple in some combination of forms. Um, so, you know, some of the uh, like famously studied circuit complexity classes uh, include NC0, right, this uh, uh, class of constant depth circuits. Like, uh, so as you grow the input length, uh, the uh, depth is not allowed to increase with a polynomial number of gates, which are allowed to be ands, ors, and nots, like uh, with sort of bounded fanon. Um, okay, then uh, like larger than this class is NC1, uh, where uh, instead of constant depth, now you're allowed a polylogarithmic, uh, sorry, uh, a logarithmic growth uh, in, the, um, uh, in the depth. Uh, and in between, uh, you know, there are these uh, classic shallow complexity classes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. also uh, this kind of lives, uh, of course, uh, within like, um, uh, like larger complexity classes that still um, correspond to efficient algorithms. Um, okay, so now uh, between NC0 and NC1, I guess, uh, you know, we notice that NC0 cannot even express the end of all the inputs. So, uh, like, let's add the uh, and and or and call that AC0. Um, it's a classic result that AC0 does not contain parity, the XOR of all the inputs. Uh, so, you know, uh, what do we do? We just add that to our basis of, like, uh, computational units and get this uh, AC with counters or ACC0 class, right? Um, and... Um, Okay, then uh, you know, we can consider adding other things like the majority gate, uh, and this gives us this uh, class TC0, and uh, you know, within even NC1 is a class, we should think of it as a class of like efficiently, uh, like efficient parallel algorithms, uh, and within this there, uh, this class, there is some taxonomy of, um, uh, of uh, circuit classes. Um, and here, I guess some general, uh, like, uh, just uh, 
contours of this field of study. The positive results uh, tend to be like non-trivial constructions uh, for parallel algorithms to solve some task like integer division. Um, and uh, maybe some example in our trivial uh, case here uh, was, well, since we noticed that the transformation semigroup of the parity semi-automaton is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order two, um, this entails that simulation of the like of uh, this uh, semi-automaton can be performed by an ACC zero circuit, right? Uh, just given a mod two global gate. Um, and here, I guess the the, the uh, practice of developing negative results here uh, is uh, certainly just um, you know the question of circuit lower bounds, uh, and there are lots of uh, you know embarrassingly perhaps embarrassingly open problems here. Uh, you know we we don't even know if ACC zero uh, is separated from no. the NP. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> I agree. Great. Um. Okay, so now let's get into some deep learning. Um, so, uh, okay, we talked about circuits. Uh, well, neural architectures, uh, maybe as a like an easy jumping point, are just circuits, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, just from some reductionist definition, like the definition of a neural network is just some computational graph, uh, and uh, we will usually consider such graphs with uh, trainable continuous parameters. Um, and within these, we have recurrent neural nets, uh, which are architectures that bake in the state emulation solution in some sense, right? So uh, just uh, for uh, some notation here, uh, like a recurrent net, uh, just for our purposes, ingests a sequence of big T vectors um, and applies some time invariant uh, continuous transformation uh, to these vectors, uh, say parameterized you know, by a linear function in uh, the previous uh, hidden state. Uh, plus a linear function in uh, you know, the current input vector, uh, and that's going to and uh, put through some nonlinear function, let's say a sigmoid, uh, like this determines one transition step, which is repeated big T times to get the sequence of HTs, right? And almost by design, like uh, or trivially or tautologically, this subsumes uh, semi-automata, uh, so that like certainly we can believe uh, quite easily that this can uh, represent semi-automata. Right, uh, like just uh, look at um, this uh, the discrete um, definition as some kind of a special case of uh, this like recurrent network framework. Um, and here, while uh, you know going uh, way downstream to deep learning, uh, if like we train a recurrent neural net to uh, you know, perform some task and it succeeds, uh, then really uh, like uh, this corresponds to uh, identifying some uh, in general nonlinear state space model that uh, like say fits the data. Um, and uh, can, uh, of course, a state safe model is just a continuous uh, like automaton or semi-automaton, uh, and that's really just what an RNN is. Okay, now let's talk about transformers. Um, so uh, maybe those who have not been uh, completely in the weeds with uh, working on transformers, uh, like might just have kind of uh, eyes glaze over at the uh, at the unnecessary like multitude of uh, details here. Um, but I'll, I'll give some like high level abstract uh, like um, it, intuitions for what the transformer is. Um, it, trying to omit like details that we won't talk about in this talk. Um, and the, the thing to realize here is that the transformer is typically way shallower than the sequence lengths uh, it um, uh, it processes. And it uh, is a non-recurrent network in like customary applications. You know, uh, no one's telling you not to use a recurrent transformer, uh, but say GPT-3 is a 96 layer transformer, uh, just concretely that uh, like uh, that processes like input sequences of length 2000. Okay, now, uh, uh, like, uh, I guess this is the, the key innovation, like within the design of the transformer architecture is uh, this self attention head will present the causal version thereof. Um, so, uh, like, uh, uh, I'll just kind of describe it using a picture, uh, because that will be the most um, uh, useful for our talk. Um, so uh, uh, causal uh, self-attention head uh, takes in, uh, just like an RNN, a sequence of uh, big T vectors in dimension D, um, and it you know, has is associated with some trainable parameters, and it outputs a single vector, okay? Uh, so you know, think of this as some kind of uh, operation that uh, like some pooling or uh, selection 
operation that uh, this head is meant to uh, implement. It's supposed to kind of look at some position or some uh, combination of positions, right? Uh, so the way it's going to do that is it's going to take, uh, well, three trainable uh, like projections uh, of the, this uh, sequence of inputs. Uh, so pr project the, um, uh, the inputs into these three spaces like uh, and give us uh, this, these sequences of vectors, uh, Qs, Ks, and Vs. Uh, with the, you know, a particular Q uh, for a particular head, uh, it's going to uh, compute the inner products, uh, you know, these alignment scores, you know, between like the single QT vector and all of the uh, all of the key vectors, the the um, uh, the K tau vectors. Um, uh, okay, it's going to grab these scores. Uh, it's going to uh, put that vector right of length big T through a softmax function uh, that's uh, exponentiate and then divide by the sum. Uh, so uh, like uh, turns this into a convex combination, and then mixes the V's uh, with this uh, with this mixture. Right. So uh, now, if the uh, if the softmax function effectively uh, just um, uh, kind of uh, plucks out one coordinate, right? If one of the inputs is uh, much is uh, is sufficiently larger than the others, uh, then this exponential uh, will kind of uh, cause that coordinate to be to dominate the others um, in the normalization. Uh, then uh, you can think of a self attention head as uh, like like one adaptive pointer into one position in the data. Um, the, like uh, um, like this diagram, um, right? And so, you know, in this cartoon, uh, we'll get this like right pointing vector. Um, and uh, well, the softmax uh, kind of uh, has other modes too. Um, uh, and I guess I didn't mention that uh, like this uh, causal parenthetical uh, just means that uh, we are kind of uh, blocking out dependencies on the future. Like right? we're kind of uh, uh, only attending, uh, we only get to mix uh, items in the past and we uh, set the other weights to zero. Um, so, uh, so then there is another operation that, uh, like an attention head in the transformer can perform, uh, which is, uh, this like a uh, soft attention modality, right? Uh, so certainly if you take a softmax of a bunch of zeros, uh, you'll just get the uniform distribution, uh, so that the softmax is able to mix the V embeddings of, uh, like, um, uh, uh like, a, of a large support of, um, of its inputs. Okay, and then the transformer architecture is just a composition of like of many self attention heads, uh, and maybe there are more details such as like uh, you know, position wise speed forward networks. Uh, but uh, here, uh, maybe just the, uh, like the it suffices to note that um, these attention heads uh, dictate the information flow, uh, just like the uh, like the fan in uh, entries in like a gate in a circuit. Okay, uh, and then okay, so it's clear maybe what RNNs are, right? Recurrent nets uh, like have this state this state space structure uh, like baked into the architecture. Uh, so some question here, some innocent question is, uh, what are transformers? Uh, you know, what kinds of functions do they represent or prefer to represent? Uh, and maybe some answer here uh, is like, uh, well, the tautological one that uh, transformers are circuits uh, because neural nets are just circuits. Um, but uh, you know, perhaps not much can be said uh, usefully beyond that, and you know, perhaps like that sort of expressivity, you know, uh, like that we have circuits, uh, like you know, compositions of functions um, uh, for a limited number of layers, uh, and uh, that does just coincide with the uh, with the function class of transformers, uh, perhaps. Uh, the ambiguity of like what transformers, uh, what functions transformers can describe is actually the same as the difficulty of uh, establishing like circuit lower bounds. All right. Uh, so uh, the answer is we don't know. Okay, uh, now let's get into our theoretical results. Um, so I just introduced uh, all of these, uh, like all this uh, terminology um, in order to build up to uh, some statements and questions that compile. Right. Uh, and I guess the question we'll be interested in is, well, if evidently transformers are performing these like sequential reasoning operations, if like evidently even in context without further training, uh, you know, uh, like the sorting this list of numbers, right, like they're able to execute sequential algorithms. Uh, well, 
then uh, is it like, and we do have shallow transformers like compared to like the amount of input uh, that you know, uh, is fed into uh, like these networks in state of the art models, uh, then you know, we can ask this question, uh, are deep reasoning chains as in like long simulations of uh, automata and semi-automata realizable by shallow transformers? Um, and okay, we can uh, just uh, refine this question a little bit uh, and ask, well, which which semi-automata are amenable to shallower simulations, right? Uh, so like what what is the full space of generalizations of that like uh, of that one layer parity solution that we found? Um, and uh, another question is, can transformers represent these computational units? And that will be somewhat more straightforward and procedural. Um, so uh, I guess the, we'll take the connection between transformers and uh, like circuits with wide fanning uh, for granted. Okay, uh, so now uh, comes a maybe semi-interactive part of this talk. Uh, where we will present our theory results in the format of brain teasers. Uh, so we want uh, participation. Um, so I will give you a semi-automaton. And uh, you know, just like our example with the parity counter, you will sketch a parallel circuit, or you know, shout out guesses or keywords uh, um, for parallel circuits uh, that sol successfully solve this simulation problem. Here, just uh, like give me a sh as shallow a solution as possible, mapping the inputs uh, to the state sequence correctly. Um, so, so some example here as a warm up is a mod five counter. Uh, you know, with five states and you know, the transitions are just like my, uh, the parity counter, but we have this mod five. Um, and uh, certainly the solution is just to change the two into a five uh, from our previous one. Um, so, so, yes. so again, like, if, what are the allowed gates here? Like, so... Uh, yeah, uh, great. So you so like shallow be, 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 means you're allowing like an, an gates uh, with sums with unbounded Yes, sums. so let us take modular summation gates uh, and like you know let, let's say acc zero okay uh so so a first question here is uh well what like how prevalent are these shortcuts what's the most generic thing we can say about these uh sorts of shortcut solutions uh so you know uh let's say we have some arbitrary finite state semi-automaton uh then uh well certainly uh the explicit state emulation uh like uh implementation is not a shallow shortcut for it because its depth is uh, is large, uh, but um, it, it is like a poly size circuit, right? And on the other extreme, uh, there is a memorization solution, which simply uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, implements uh, the kind of exhaustive truth table of this entire uh, map. Uh, but the, this is not going to count uh, because we also maybe want um, a polynomial number of gates in this circuit, right? Uh, otherwise, we kind of have a vacuous result. Um, and uh, you know, we, we certainly need some non-trivial ideas here. Uh, you know, if we just try to kind of uh, you know, cheat by fast forwarding, say through like root T layers at once, uh, th this will not fulfill the uh, condition of a polynomial number of gates still. Um, okay, so uh, is there a generic solution uh, with a poly T number of gates uh, and much fewer than T layers? So this is something like, do we think of these as iterative matrix multiplication, or is this like not the same thing? Very good, Boaz. Uh, so uh, the title of the next slide is uh, recursive matrix multiplication. Excellent. Uh, so uh, then that means I can skip through uh, this faster. Uh, so each okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so okay, we notice that there is this transformation semigroup. Uh, so and of course, function composition is just matrix multiplication. Uh, so maybe we can convince ourselves that if we have a chain of matrices, uh, and we can just perform this binary operation of multiplying two matrices of constant size, uh, then we can, uh, you know, we can have like a logarithmic depth solution uh, that works for all semi automata with the same complexity as like, uh, you know, one matrix multiplication per, uh, um, per node here. Uh, so that um, uh, of course this is just the parallel prefix on the uh, matrix multiplication kind of uh, algorithm uh, and uh, maybe some application here I want to point out is uh, you know this is how uh, like number uh, like uh, integers are added in inside your like uh, inside your uh, like computer hardware um, because uh, like adders are among the algorithms that uh, can be expressed uh, as semi-automata with a like constant state size. Okay, uh, so I guess that question was too easy in some sense, uh, like allowing log T layers uh, like uh, just allowed us to have this like very generic solution. Um, so then uh, maybe we should ask a harder question, uh, which automata admit constant depth uh, like ACC zero simulations? 
Um, okay, so that brings us to puzzle number two. Uh, so we're going to try to uh, simulate some non-commutative operation. Uh, so uh, just for a little cartoon, uh, imagine you have a reversible car on a circular road. So uh, you know, the, the state is the orientation of the car as well as the, uh, as, as the location. Um, and uh, now there are... I want to say yeah. that uh, uh, we don't know how to prove that uh, essentially uh, anything except like very, very complex functions like a uh, next uh, is outside of ACC zero. Uh, right. Uh, although we do believe that uh, even majority is outside. Uh, right. Um, so here, um, okay. Uh, let's see what your uh, answer to this puzzle is. Um, so then there are two inputs, uh, you know, advance the car in the direction that it's facing or reverse the uh, like, you know, direction of a car. Um, okay, we can write down the transition table explicitly, uh, but uh, that's uh, just what I said intuitively. Um, and uh, the observation here is that it's not going to suffice uh, just to take some prefix sums uh, and uh, you know mash them together and uh, like uh, you know apply some function uh, to prefix sums uh, like we did in the mod two and mod five counter uh, constructions uh, because uh, like the order of the operations actually uh, matters here. Um, right. So I guess uh, my question here is, is there still a solution, an efficient uh, you know, circuit uh, that has a constant number of layers to simulate this uh, non-commutative operation of uh, you know, reversing and driving a car? Yes, excellent. That is 100% the right answer. All right. Um, so uh, I guess uh, what we have really constructed is a factorization of like the uh, transformation semi-group, which is really a permutation group of this machine. Uh, like we've kind of factorized it into a normal subgroup and, you know, this like, uh, you know, parity uh, automaton. Um, so uh, I guess intuitively, right, uh, as you've noted, uh, like simulating this machine uh, reduces uh, in a sort of non-commutative way uh, to uh, like implementing mod n and mod 2 counters. Um, so exactly as you said, we'll, uh, like a first step can be to compute parities, like all the prefix parities, and then at each time we'll get the uh, overall like, uh, like um, orientation of the car. Uh, and that will allow us, you know, uh, for each uh, like uh, prefix to figure out like how to remap, you know, how to convert uh, the kind of drive operations into uh, like a, this canonical representation, right? Uh, we can kind of uh, like uh, flip the ones where you know, the, uh, the car is facing counterclockwise, uh, then simply take a prefix sum of those uh, and integrate those like, uh, you know, the, those displacements in the like canonical coordinates, uh, and then uh, just uh, correct the sort of uh, flipping that you did earlier. Um, so generally, indeed, uh, if you have any uh, semi-direct product of groups that you can simulate, uh, this gives you some construction to get constant depth uh, ways to uh, simulate non-abelian groups. Uh, even more generally, uh, like a special case, uh, like a, of a semi-direct product uh, is a wreath product. Uh, right, a wreath product is a like a more, uh, I guess, uh, advanced way to combine two groups, uh, and uh, like uh, constant depth simulators are uh, like uh, also possible as long as you can uh, like uh, simulate the components there. Um, and uh, like the wreath product is, in, uh, which I won't define, I guess, in this talk, uh, is uh, interesting because it does like fully. Uh, solve the uh, group extension problem, right? If you have uh, like any two groups, uh, then, and you consider the wreath product, that wreath product contains all the ways, uh, like, you know, it contains all the groups which uh, have one of them as a normal subgroup and the other one as a quotient, uh, right? And like the quaternion group is some example that uh, where you need these non-split extensions. Uh, great. Um, okay, uh, even harder puzzle. Um, so, uh, but maybe a little more innocent seeming. Uh, now we're in this, uh, going back to this 1D grid world example, right? So we have these uh, two inputs left and right, uh, which move you along some like linear chain of states, uh, but there are walls on either side. So uh, left at the left wall does nothing, for example, right? Uh, so now, uh, like, you know, let's try to simulate this semi-automaton. Is there a shortcut with a constant number of layers, right? We already know there's a logarithmic number of layers. 
Uh, so uh, I guess intuitively here, uh, viewing this as moving, like keeping track of where you are in a grid world, uh, we want to keep track of where we are, uh, but use some global statistics to kind of bypass uh, the need to actually uh, perform the step-by-step -step, um, transitions of the, of the machine. And yeah, recall that like uh, these transformations now are non-invertible. We don't have a permutation group. Any keywords or guesses for what to do? I mean, I don't know if that's true. Like, uh, do you think of the grid world that uh, like the, the this is constant like number of the uh, like so four is like a constant here? Uh, I think of four as a constant for now. Like a, a solution with that like will suffice. So in some sense, you can uh, try to maybe keep like four. Uh, I'm not sure if like how maybe you can try to kind of keep in power like four of the hypotheses of uh, where was the last time you got stuck or something. Like the, the last time you hit the wall or, or the number of steps you are away from a wall. I think that is more progress than uh, anyone we have done this puzzle format to has uh, made on this problem. Uh, we'd, we'd like to. Uh, keep generating from the language model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So first, I'll give a, a like a like a sort of much more general solution, uh, which will actually bludgeon this problem, um, which is uh, to appeal to the crone roads theorem. Um, so I guess uh, this is something that uh, we learned in the like uh, process of you know doing this research. Uh, I guess we found it very surprising on like a visceral level. Um, so I guess there are kind of factorization type theorems in uh, algebraic objects, uh, you know, for uh, which are generalizations of you know the old fact that uh, you know the um, uh, integers admit prime factorizations. Okay, uh, so uh, some like very fancy generalization of this is that uh, groups uh, like uh, admit these factorizations into simple groups as well. Um, and I guess some question uh, just uh, is like if we uh, peel off like the the axioms of you know uh, invertibility and identity from groups, and we only ha have a binary operation that is like only associative. Uh, you know, do we know anything about this uh, algebraic structure? Uh, you know, are there any like factorizations, uh, like uh, any canonical forms uh, that we can uh, put down uh, or have the existence of? You know, well, like what is the generic structure of semigroups? Um, so I guess uh, you know the resounding uh, answer to this is yes, uh, and uh, this is the Crone Rhodes theorem for semigroups, right? Uh, so uh, it tells you uh, that uh, every semigroup is contained within the alternating wreath product of some simple groups and copies of the flip-flop monoid, uh, which is just the transformation um, uh, semigroup associated with this like memory semi-automaton. Uh, uh, right, and uh, like uh, this is the same wreath product as uh, in the uh, embedding theorem uh, as the generalization of the semi-direct uh, construction. Um, okay, there's also like a sort of computational interpretation of this, uh, which is that uh, any semi-automaton uh, can be simulated uh, by a cascade of um, permutation reset uh, semi-automata uh, whose like actions are either permutations like group operations or resets right like uh, sort of maximally forgetful operations uh, and like the um, the uh, the transformation semi-groups of these individual machines uh, just correspond to uh, like these sim simple groups in the factorization. Um, so this is some very, very fancy, uh, you know, vast generalization of, you know, the prime factorization of integers. Um, right, and this wreath product of really just uh, embeds uh, into like a sort of uh, a feed forward cascade of like dependencies uh, so that like the earlier machines control the later ones, just like how in the semi-direct uh, like a uh, car simulation, the parity sort of uh, controls the mapping of coordinates for the steps uh, of the like driving of the car. Um, okay, uh, so I guess uh, there it turns out to be a more refined solution to the uh, uh, to the grid world um, simulation problem. Um, we, uh, it boils down to getting a most recent time we hit the wall detector uh, that can run in parallel. Um, and uh, I guess uh, 
you know, there, there might, if you're trying to kind of uh, imagine some lower bound here, uh, like, you know, just uh, try to argue that the grid world is not simulable, uh, then we might try to like prove some fake lemma, you know, that uh, we can only know whether we're at a wall if we knew the previous time we were at a wall. Uh, but, you know, uh, so what actually happened here, just skipping forward to the experiments a little bit, uh, is that, uh, you know, we trained a transformer to simulate like movement in a grid world. Uh, and it figured out the solution before we did, right? Uh, so it figured uh, out some kind of a uh, parallel mechanism uh, for uh, detecting whether you're at a wall, uh, you know, even though uh, maybe it didn't occur in the training time of that transformer uh, to you know, uh, folks in this room. Um, uh, and for what that is, uh, I guess we'll take that offline. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, this lemma is false. Okay, uh, so now I'll just uh, quickly state, uh, you know, uh, we uh, went through all these puzzles, uh, they just basically comprise our theoretical results. Uh, for any length t, uh, like, you know, we have poly size transformer constructions with which uh, represent simulators for all automata. This is just this uh, parallel prefix um, matrix multiplication um, uh, algorithm. Uh, furthermore, there's an accompanying lower bound via Barrington's theorem uh, for like, uh, you know, uh, for the like worst case uh, semi-automata. Uh, and for automata whose crone roads decompositions do not lead to any uh, like uh, non-abelian simple groups, uh, otherwise known as like solvable, um, like if we are familiar with the notion of solvable groups, um, uh, we have uh, simulations uh, like simulators uh, with the number of layers that is constant in terms of the uh, input size, right? Uh, which only depends on the size of the um, of the machine. Um, okay, uh, and uh, I guess uh, we kind of uh, noted this uh, this um, even shallower simulator where the number of layers also does not even depend on the size of the grid world, uh, like for this special uh, class of um, of semi automata. Um, and uh, I would like to note that uh, I guess the connection between circuit complexity and simulation of uh, automata and semi automata was, uh, I guess, um, uh, really uh, uh, outlined, I guess, surveyed, and there were some new results in that paper uh, in this uh, very impressive paper that we came across while doing this research uh, by Barrington and Terrien. Uh, it's called like uh, on finite monoids and the fine structure of NC1. Uh, and if we kind of start from uh, like use that as a starting point, uh, well, we kind of embed these constructions parameter efficiently uh, in transformers and with a small norm. And that uh, takes quite some kind of uh, technical work just to bridge the exact constructions with the transformers. Uh, and theorem three seems to be new. It seems to be an even more efficient construction for this class of automata than the ones guaranteed by these uh, generic uh, like factorization theorems. And it seems to just uh, maybe come from the fact that we are studying this new continuous like circuit complexity class of transformers. OK. Uh, uh, sorry, we are a little short on time, uh, so I will zip through empirical results. Um, okay, okay, cool. Um, so I guess, uh, like theory, maybe can only ask the first question that we really care about, you know, towards like understanding and improving transformers here. Uh, and uh, well, that is that at least in principle, shallow non-recurrent networks can represent long reasoning chains. Uh, you know, they can simulate um, automata with a like a very low depth. Uh, and okay, then we can ask like whether this matters or whether this is realistic. Um, and uh, so. I guess there are lots of kind of uh, natural, say, training pipelines uh, for you know, deep neural nets we can write down where we have no hope of precisely understanding the uh, you know, the global properties of the trajectories of training. Uh, but we uh, we turn to experiments with synth synthetic data uh, to probe you know phenomena uh, and kind of build a bridge towards um, practice. Um, and uh, I guess uh, in prior work, uh, it's been considered uh, to just uh, feed like these language models, train these language models on synthetic distributions, which uh, actually are special cases of simulating semi-automata and automata. Um, and so we'll just uh, like downstream from the data generation, we'll just run the same pipeline as GPT-3. Um, okay, so then we can ask a bunch of questions, right? Like, uh, well, one is optimization. Like, uh, can gradient-based training uh, actually find shortcut solutions, uh, even though we've restricted the depth so much? Um, okay, uh, like, to what extent does this work, right? Uh, can we make this setting more challenging? Um, okay, the third question is, what's the drawback? What's the price of this sort of, uh, like, uh, this alternate solution? Like, are there any kind of uh, statistical shortcomings? 
Uh, and uh, finally, like uh, like transformers have this like uh, non-recurrent mode of just outputting the whole sequence at once. Uh, can we actually kind of force the transformer to learn the the state simulation solution? Uh, and for spoilers, um, you know, the answers are yes, uh, like you know, uh, yes up to a point, uh, and uh, certainly we can learn the recurrent solutions. But we have actually identified in this uh, research like a potential drawback of transformers for simulating long reasoning chains uh, that may apply to practice. Um, Okay, so I will be quick with the yeses, uh, you know, basically for a variety of um, you know, uh, semi-automata corresponding to various algebraic structures, uh, like even for simulating these like non-solvable groups, like, uh, you know, the alternating group on five elements, end-to-end uh, uh, -end training works. Right? This uh, certainly is far beyond the theory of like convex optimization. Uh, and to begin to think about how, uh, you know, I guess uh, the, this gets into the fine-grained um, you know, theory of deep learning uh, and uh, we have uh, some work, including with uh, Sham and Boaz and Ben in the uh, audience, um, uh, on you know the uh, uh, what we can say or understand about the nuts and bolts of uh, this. Um, okay. Uh, so, and we can consider well worsening the supervision, and we find that uh, actually uh, the training is still robust, right? We can consider masking many of the states, uh, some large fraction of the states, or you know, be in the full automata setting where we only get some like partial observations, such as whether the machine, like corresponding to a regular expression parser, actually accepts. Uh, and the takeaway here is that uh, like uh, SGD isn't too brittle; like optimization actually is quite tolerant to worse, like uh, making the uh, supervision more challenging. Um, okay, so now I want to get to the third point. Uh, like, and the, there's this question of whether these shortcut solutions have some kind of statistical brittleness, right? And the setup here uh, is to simply evaluate this model, uh, these models under uh, outlier uh, sequences in the distribution. Right? So we can perform this thought experiment, like again for this parity semi automaton and the shortcut solution. Well, we notice that the shortcut solution is doing something kind of fishy. It's taking a sum, right? And if this network, uh, like, is uh, really implementing this like summation and then mod two operation, uh, then well, uh, there's going to be this uh, you know spurious uh, like variable that was imagined by this network uh, of you know, taking the sum, uh, and the sum is in particular going to concentrate, right? If the like uh, inputs arise uh, like from like uh, independent coin flips, uh, like so. Uh, if the network is really uh, like if a shallow network is really relying on counting to simulate long reasoning chains here, uh, we might expect uh, that for counts that are unseen in the training data, uh, like under distribution shift, uh, you know, the, these networks actually uh, fail to predict correctly. Uh, and indeed, we have experiments for this. Uh, so, uh, you know, they do perform poorly under distribution shift. Uh, so, you know, the, we like now just taking a step back, we posited maybe some recurrent belief of like, you know, some two state automaton. Uh, and then this network learned some solution that was much shallower computationally, uh, but it actually came at the statistical price of hallucinating this variable uh, for which uh, it does not know how to handle outliers. Um, and uh, I guess uh, some kind of moral uh, from our paper here is that the strong like representational like uh, you know containment of uh, recurrent concepts within non shallow non recurrent uh, you know, architectures uh, means that you may only be able to diagnose uh, this sort of uh, brittleness uh, with out of distribution evaluation. Um, Okay, uh, and uh, as promised and said, uh, like uh, we can use the sort of uh, chain of thought uh, training and inference uh, to kind of coerce a transformer to output like uh, just one of the states at a time, uh, giving us back the recurrent solution. Um, and I guess uh, here, uh, there is an open challenge even on this synthetic data. Uh, which is to resolve the problem from the previous slide of like uh, hallucinating statistically brittle variables um, while still maintain like retaining the uh, parallelizability of the uh, like of the non-recurrent architecture. Right? Uh, so certainly uh, in all the uh, like resolutions that we found in this and like related work, uh, we needed to simulate the reasoning chain like kind of carefully in order to observe like uh, empirical uh, robust extrapolation. Um, okay, uh, sorry for speeding through that. Um, I guess I will leave some discussion of that uh, I have already talked about, right? That shortcuts are good and bad, uh, you know, just uh, in like uh, as a very brief flyover, uh, that 
Uh, they give us the benefit of lower computational depth, and this may be a useful, like say, engineering tool in deep learning. Right? Like, if even if we have recurrent concepts that we'd like to simulate uh, in as like uh, kind of uh, sub procedures in our like uh, reasoning systems, like these giant language models, uh, like the uh, the computational benefit of uh, of like shallowness uh, may explain you know, like maybe a key part in why the transformer uh, is so successful uh, and kind of scales so well. Um, but the the catch here is of brittleness, right? That like uh, recurrent networks naturally like induce like a uniform uh, like um, like family of like circuits which like matches the uh, growing like structure of like arbitrary length. Um, like uh, semi-automaton uh, calculation uh, computations, um, and if we are to uh, solve pro like the problem of simulation using some different architecture, uh, there is the hazard of uh, hallucinating variables uh, that give you uh, unnecessary statistical brittleness. Um, Okay, uh, so I have a bunch more topics here that I guess in like individual meetings with other people or you know if, if this uh, anything catches anyone's eye here, um, you know, uh, I'm happy to uh, discuss offline. Um, and then you know this is uh, in the space of speculating on perhaps how to understand the failure modes of transformers and uh, like eventually kind of climb the ladder out of like difficult synthetic problems and try to solve difficult uh, non synthetic problems. Uh, and maybe I want to uh, just leave off with a few thoughts, uh, and uh, this will take like two minutes. Um, okay, uh, so maybe the uh, you know ultimate meta question, you know, in the domain of say improving deep learning here, like the, this is really some special case of uh, this like very very messy problem of uh, algorithm design in the real world. Uh, given the resources we have, data and compute wise, uh, you know, what are the algorithms we should run, uh, and Maybe uh, there's this kind of frustrating theme that emerges where in classical algorithm design, say designing of a sorting algorithm, um, you know, you uh, are only like you're only accountable like for you know, when you're trying to uh, fulfill the contract of sorting, uh, like uh, you're only responsible for like a very exact notion of like say computational efficiency and correctness. Uh, and in deep learning, uh, you know, we, we just have all sorts of uh, uh, kind of emergent phenomena that uh we can only control indirectly and kind of engineering trade-offs like you know computation versus statistics uh, right so i'm uh, listing a bunch of themes here uh, i guess that we can kind of uh, revisit um uh, offline uh and uh, of course there's this uh, question of like understanding these models uh maybe uh and uh some prank uh, that i'm pulling on you here is that this is green uh, because this last point was uh, predicted correctly uh, by a language model, uh, you know, fed uh, the prefix of this slide. Um, okay, uh, so uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, that's all I have. I'm going to leave up a summary of the results here, as well as uh, just uh, pictures of my wonderful collaborators, um, and uh, I'll take any questions after that. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much. Um, great talk. So uh, we will take questions. Uh... We can take uh, questions online. If someone in the room has a question, I'll give you the uh, microphone. Uh, maybe I have a question. Um, hi, uh, I just I think I didn't get the part. Uh, where does the actual architecture of the transformer with the attention module come in, into this calculation? I mean, why should um, you use the Rhodes theorem and so on? Ah, right. Um, so the Cron Rhodes theorem entails uh, an ACC zero circuit construction, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, given some, uh, some semi automaton and its uh, Cron Rhodes factorization. Uh, it gives you some procedure for turning that into some cascade of semi automata mm -hmm. where, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, each semi-automaton just uh, receives inputs that depend on all their predecessors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess we are embedding that construction, like uh, just uh, every uh, kind of detail in that construction into the weights of a transformer. Um, okay. So okay. some question I guess here is why is this not just encompassed by universal function approximation? Uh, and so here, I guess I've hidden the sort of innovation here in the word parameter efficient in that uh, the way that the transformer performs weight sharing actually allows for an extremely like a uh, parameter, like a, a concise, uh, like embedding of this precise construction. 
So, so in other words, if it was just a feed-forward neural network without the attention module, this wouldn't be implemented so efficiently. Right. Uh, furthermore, I guess this is this is uh, done after we posted this paper. Uh, we, you know, trained like uh, standard feedforward networks on the simulation problems, and uh, funnily, SQD did not arrive at the good solution. Uh, it did not arrive at the accurate solutions. Okay. And is there some explanation? Some some explanation for that? Uh, that's a, I guess that's a very very hard question. Um, okay. Yeah, but it, it seems okay. Uh, so heuristically, I can speculate uh, that the weight sharing, weight sharing in architectures, uh, I guess, uh, like, like, uh, sometimes they make optimization easier, sometimes they make it harder. And this may be one of the situations where like weight sharing, like, uh, makes optimization easier. All right, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, like basically what I want uh, wanted to say. So uh, when you said that we can actually guide transformers to learn uh, recurrent solution, how do you check check it? Like, do you need to like in in increase the depth for it it, uh, it to perform well when the in in input length for them? Like, why do you know it's a recurrent solution? Ah, okay. So by recurrent uh, solution here, I mean uh like we are training a transformer instead of outputting the entire uh, like state sequence at once, uh, you know, just like a next word prediction, uh, like it is uh, you know, trained and evaluated on just outputting like a, you know, a, like a one step continuation of a sequence. Uh, so now if that sequence contains uh, actually the current state, right, the, like this is the kind of notion of like a chain of thought, then we are explicitly supervising with like the sequence of states. Uh, and like then one step of the transformer uh, like is only responsible for computing like one like you know transition step uh, the one delta. Uh, okay. So is it like a layer one transformer and uh, if these are the same weights repeated for each uh, for, for each? Yeah, I think layer like depths uh, like a very low depth. I think maybe like two suffices. Okay, so we are specifically one. changing the task to predict pred pred the next. Right. So, to what extent do you think this discussion of brittleness so the added distribution of robustness? Like, do you think that explains the advantage of um, scratch mat or chain plotters and all the shortcuts of solution for preventing the data like sample efficiency or optimization gains to the um that's a good question um okay so we did perform out of distribution evaluation and uh like uh, i guess in the synthetic examples like it's very clear that like the uh transformer inherits like the uh the disadvantages of counting right um i guess this is not inherent in that you could just bake some counting mod p uh like a sinusoid uh into the architecture itself uh and just like uh hope to incur like a uh, kind of promote uh, the promote the learning of uh periodic functions and extrapolate to kind of periods unseen in the training input right so like that could be one uh, benign solution uh, that could, uh, you know, just act, at least deal with like cyclic phenomena, you know, such as parity. Uh, as for how this shows up in like uh, real language, let's say, it, it does seem that in evaluating like transformers on algorithmic tasks, uh, you know, the outliers are the uh, like like I think we we. Uh, one could imagine that, like, uh, like if one did some analysis on the failure modes of like some code completion uh, model, uh, like on kind of outlier um, uh, completions where the completions uh, could admit some counting solution, uh, then uh, I guess this would apply. 
uh, I guess we have not done that analysis in our paper, um, but uh, certainly there uh, like is a whole kind of industry of like a completely empirical paper is taking trained models and evaluating like uh, like where they fail. Um, and it seems that like uh, outliers with respect to hallucinated variables like uh, you know, may well be uh, like some framework by which to start like solving the really hard problem of interpreting these like uh, trained models on the real complicated distributions. More questions? If, if there are no more questions, let's uh, conclude the final uh, uh, sign off. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Cyril again. Thanks. There's a link in any of our seminars for the uh, class transfers. So, uh, thanks everybody for joining.